like if you ask me what does just mean, my answer would not be it is in the proper place in the great you know universal order of being. Uh huh, Brevin, you seem to know a lot of what just is. I, on the other hand, know nothing of what just is. Surely you can enlighten me, Socrates. Go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> I deserve that. <laughs> does Socrates believe in hell? I don't think he does. He believed in some vague afterlife. But definitely. You just get locked in the cave doing puppet shows. Is what happens. <laughs> that is hell. You don't even get to escape. You just have to be the first person who does the puppet shows. Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another episode of The Problem with Reading. I'm Brevin. I'm Steven. And I'm Sam. And here we are with yet another exciting chapter uh, of McIntyre, which we were just discussing. Uh, the summary that Steven made ran five pages. We cut out the one random part with esoteric Greek words that he never defines, or defines in paragraphs, and then retracts them and redefines them. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, so, so so how how was this chapter, boys? It was rough. It was a rough one. It was one. a little rough, not going to lie. Um, it was definitely a difficult read. It, he, he brought up a lot of intriguing ideas of kind of where Plato got some stuff wrong, where the Homeric heroes got stuff wrong, um, where he, I was surprised by how much he kept nodding in approval towards Sophocles, Sophocles of all people, not Plato. Um, it's, it's rare to find a philosopher that's just like, yeah, Plato screwed that up. Well, it's just Plato is a uh, is the pre-incarnation of Kant in this schema, kind of. That is true. Kind of. Yeah. Um, yeah, so he's kind of enemy number zero. Enemy number zero. Yep. Um. Uh. But but Sam, uh, how's your how's your week been? Doing. doing it, good it's stuff? been it's been good. I mean, um, I'm an undergraduate, so we're um we're in dead week right now. I've got about five five major papers due, none of which I've started. So good. that's going to be I, fun. Hey. It's good to see that your priorities are straight and that you are here recording this podcast. I read I, I, this morning. I got up. I looked at my, my to-do list. And I had reading either a book for a political theory essay um, or reading McIntyre, and I chose McIntyre. So, you chose but, well. And then I read the chapter, and I regret. I re- regretted it. It was um, definitely not the best chapter. <laughs> no. Except, no. Yep. yep. How about you, Stephen? How's life? Uh, life's good. Uh, I have graduated uh, several years ago, so I spent my week at work and not in classes, which I I say somewhat lamentably. I actually really I, I really miss math and computer science and philosophy classes. Those were those were really nice. But um, yeah, on the whole, work was good, and uh, I read McIntyre. Very similar thing. I woke up this morning, realized that I'd procrastinated on McIntyre for the whole week, and then had to do everything. And boy, did it take me a lot longer than I thought it was going to. Now, we haven't gotten to the chapters which are very explicitly on Aristotle, but that's upcoming. But one thing that Aristotle talks about is habituating virtue. So one thing that I do is every time I'm going to work or coming back from work, after I'm saying my Catholic daily prayers, I pull out after virtue and read just a little bit of the chapter and mark notes as I'm going on the public transportation system. And, you know, I just feel like I've grown a whole lot as a person. I, I'm not procrastinating towards the end of the week, trying to read, a, you know, the whole thing in one day. You know, it's it's very nice. I just, the, the, the virtue is strong with me. I think you're lying, but I'm not sure. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. That, that is entirely what I do. Uh, dang it, he really is more virtuous than us. Uh, I was really <laughs> hoping I could bring him down to our level. <laughs> well, speaking of uh, bringing people down to uh, the lowest level, uh, Stephen, what are you drinking right now? Uh, right now, I am drinking uh, some brown bean water, uh, commonly known mm. as coffee, uh, with a bit of uh, white water in it, commonly known as milk. And uh, between the two, I, uh, I'm getting caffeine with, mm. uh, with its calorie-free, uh, unholy amounts of energy surging into my brain. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's man's best friend. I, I also, I have to enjoy the, uh, the milk for, uh, or, well, I can because this is, the, this is the last week before Lens. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss you. Uh, you're, you're a good friend. Mm. Yep, yep. No, I mean, uh, where do coffee beans originate? Uh, answer, the Middle East. Uh, and uh, where does the Necronomicon written by the mad Arab al Khazani or- originate? Also, the Middle East. Coincidence? I think not. Check me, atheist. Uh, Sam, what are you drinking? I'm drinking some Earl Grey tea, which is what I've drank for the last, what, 
several weeks. episodes I've been on. Yeah, three weeks. Um, and the reason is because I totally forgot that this was really happening until about 10 minutes before we started recording. So I ran out and made myself some tea. I'm, I, I know. I'm kind of frustrated, though, because this is actually the first episode that I would have been able to legally consume oh. an adult beverage. Um, and I didn't wow. do that. Wasted opportunity. Hey, I just I want you to like come on one week and be like, yeah, I, I, I'm Sam here, and I'm just uh, chugging down a Limerita. I'm on my fourth one. Um, <laughs> this is going to be a great episode. <laughs> that would be the best episode. I'll do that sometime. <laughs> um, as for myself, uh, I am drinking a Walker Percy Mint Julep, but with some slight modifications. I'm, instead of having it with bourbon, um, I'm having it with scotch, and I'm not sure how I feel about this, uh, but the combination of southern sickly sweet manners and the Scottish tartan bite uh, can only go well. It's actually kind of hilarious because I'm reading Love in the Ruins, a novel by Walker Percy, and I just offhandedly mention on the chapter that I just left off on, um, it just started talking about William the Bruce, the King of Scots. Uh, so that's hilarious. Um, but So here I am, and, and Sam, I will have you know that I was like contemplating this since like this morning. I'm like, damn, what am I going to be drinking today when I, re- when I uh, go on the podcast? Yeah, anyway. Uh, but speaking of contemplating things and planning for things and transition, transition, uh, Stephen, I think you have a summary for us. I do indeed, and who, boy, is it a doozy. Uh, so chapter 11, the virtues at Athens and a miniature Greek lesson. McIntyre starts off with the premise that heroic societies, uh, whether or not they existed in reality, had profound impacts on the cultures that viewed themselves as having emerged from them. Quote, the heroic literature provided a central part of the moral scriptures of these later societies, end quote. Certainly they aren't identical, McIntyre points out, but nonetheless the impact is profound and informs much of their ethical dialogue. He moves on to discussing a lack of coherence in the use of of evaluative language Athenian culture used during Plato's time. Immediately saying that Plato, in attempting to nail down his ethical system, sought to expel the Homeric conception of the virtues, faulting this conception for the incoherency. To connect this, the tragedian Sophocles is cited, specifically one of his his plays, Philoctetes, uh, in which the classic Homeric virtue of hero cunning is pitted against the, um, or is pitted against what is a dishonorable action in using this cunning. Odysseus is attempting to deceive Philoctetes, who, though not a Greek, welcomed him and his companion Neoptolemus, recalling what honor, or recalling that honor is what is due a man, and dishonor is not paying him his due. For Odysseus to deceive him is very dishonorable. But in Homer, Homer's Odyssey, this would have been considered perfectly honorable because what is due him is this bow that he is trying to steal from Philoctetes. Uh, the ethical tension demonstrates an ongoing debate in Athenian society as to what the virtues were. This indicates the transformations of the dialogue of ethics. The first is that, quote, the primary moral community is no longer the kinship group, but the city-state, and not merely the city-state in general, but the Athenian democracy in particular, end quote. The second is the abstracting of the social role of the moral character from that of a king to of a human, quote, in Homer, the question of honor is the question of what is due a king. In Sophocles, the question of honor is what it, it has become, what is due a man, uh, end quote. The question that the Athenians wrestle with is based on the central premise that to be a good human is closely related to be a good citizen, or with being a good citizen. Quote, thus the question of the relationship between being a good citizen and being a good man becomes central in knowledge of the variety of possible human practices provided the factual background to the asking of that question, end quote. And more straightforward, quote, to be a good man will, on every Greek view, be at least closely allied to being a good citizen, end quote. Uh, To highlight the differences, McIntyre goes into three primary views of virtue in Athens, the Sophists, Plato, and Sophocles, promising to get to Aristotle in a bit, uh, reminding us that the Athenian paradigm is framed around the question, what are the virtues which make the the good man and the good citizen, and what are the corresponding vices? So this is is the primary question that all these uh, different authors and groups are wrestling with. Uh, Having clarified these points, uh, McIntyre discusses the relativism of the Sophists first, citing Thrasymachus from Plato's Republic as a prime example of their philosophy. Thrasymachus, who incidentally is a cruder version of King Agamemnon from the Iliad, according to A.W.H. Adkins, whoever that is, um, is the sort of man who views everything and everyone as a means to an end, resources to his victory. Quote, so the Sophist of whom Plato's Thrasymachus is the type makes success the only goal of action and makes the acquisition of power to do and to get whatever one wants the entire content of success. A virtue is then naturally enough defined as a quality which will ensure success, end quote. Uh, 
This leads to a relativism of sorts. For success in one area is different than success in another, and the means to success will vary depending on the situation. Quote, by accepting the evaluative vocabulary of his own particular city, the sophist will sometimes find himself using expressions which themselves embody a non-relativistic standpoint inconsistent with the relativism which led him to use that vocabulary. End quote. Uh, note that this carries echoes of McIntyre's original thesis. People were using the language of ethics without fully understanding it. This leads, of course, to some problems for the sophist. Quote, and the sophist who has redefined expressions such as just, virtue, and good, so that they refer to qualities which are conducive to individual success, but who also wishes to employ the conventional vocabulary in order to achieve that success, may well find himself in one situation praising justice, because by justice nothing more is to be meant than what is in the interest of the stronger, and in another praising injustice over justice, because in, it is the practice of injustice, as conventionally understood, which is in fact in the interest of the stronger, end quote. There are some interesting points around this we can get into in our discussion, uh, but moving on, we come to Plato, who attempts uh, to construct a system of ethics with reason enjoying, enjoining each part of the soul to perform its proper function. Bodily appetites will be restrained by the reason, demonstrating sophrosunia, uh, the challenges of danger, will be met by Andrea, or courage, and the reason doing all of this will exhibit Sophia, or wisdom. Uh, oh, I should mention that Sophia Sunye is um, aristocratic uh, virtue, the ability to restrain yourself. Uh, he does a brief aside into Plato's critiques of the arts and poetics, which Sam brought up last week, but we can get into that later as well. Uh, McIntyre moves on to the tragedians, uh, who were the ones who explored the idea that the virtues can conflict with each other. What happens when the epic hero needs to acquire a bow and his host refuses to give it? He is owed the bow, recalling that honor is what is due a man, but he owes honor to his host for taking them in. The question is presented, could one virtue at least temporarily be at war with another? Two answers are given from two traditions. Plato contends that, quote, the virtues are not merely compatible with each other, but the presence of each requires the presence of all, end quote. The modernists vis-a-vis -vis Weber contend that, quote, the variety and heterogeneity of human goods is such that their pursuit cannot be reconciled in any single moral order, and that consequently any social order which either attempts such a reconciliation or which enforces the hegemony of one set of goods over all other is bound to turn into a straitjacket for the human condition. Both leave something wanting. Quote, the interest of Sophocles lies in his presentation of a view equally difficult for a Platonist or a Weberian to accept. There are indeed crucial conflicts in which different virtues appear as making rival and incompatible claims on us, but our situation is tragic in that we have to recognize the authority of both claims. There is objective moral order, but our perceptions of it are, are such that we cannot bring rival moral truths into complete harmony with each other, and yet the acknowledgement of the moral order and of the moral truth makes the kind of choice which a Weber or a Berlin, uh, that is to say, uh, Sir Isaiah Berlin, uh, urges upon us out of the question, end quote. McIntyre wraps things up, noting two important details of the protagonists of the first tragedies. tragedies. First, they are not only individuals. Quote, the moral protagonist stands in relationship to, the, to his community and his social roles, which is neither the same as that of the epic hero, nor again the same as that of a modern individualism. For like the epic hero, the Sophoclean protagonist would be nothing without his or her place in the social order, in the family, the city, the army at Troy. He or she is what society takes him to be, but he or she is not only what society takes him or her to be. He or she both belongs to a place in the social order and transcends it, and he or she does so precisely by encountering and acknowledging the kind of conflict which I have just identified. The second thing worth noting is the narrative form of the protagonist. Sophocles, much like Shakespeare would a thousand and some years later, recognized that human life has the form of dramatic narrative, quote, and this suggests a, hy a hypothesis that generally to adopt a stance on the virtues will be to adopt a stance on the narrative character of human life, end quote. He goes on to justify this by examining that human life is a progress through harms and dangers, both moral and physical, and said progress will have varying levels of successes and failures, and that in these successes and failures, we will find the virtues and vices respectfully, or respectively. Uh, quote, each human life will then embody a story which shape and form will depend upon what is accounted as a harm and danger and how and upon how success and failure, progress and its opposite, are understood and evaluated. To answer these questions will also explicitly and implicitly be to understand the questions as to what vir virtues and vices are, end quote. Uh, after this, he, he says kind of to, to be able to pick this apart more and more, we'll need to turn to Aristotle. And so next week to Aristotle, who will we turn? 
believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, that was significantly significantly cut down. I cut out most of the uh, weird Greek uh, words and uh, a lot of the the different nuances that he brought about. It was uh, it was a bear of a chapter. Well, thank you for summarizing that. Um, I, I feel like I understand it slightly more um, than I initially did. Well, that makes me feel a little better. Yeah, this this was a particularly difficult chapter. I think it also felt difficult because it didn't seem like it contributed much to his overall project. It almost seems like an aside, and that made it hard to want to focus particularly deeply on what he's talking about. Oh, I was just going to say, I think that he's going to do something with Sophocles. Like, I think that this, uh, would you say Sophoclean? Is that how it's said? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, Sophoclean perspective is is really interesting. Um, I know that you guys want to talk about its relation to Nietzsche later, but this perspective is basically a way to hold two different virtues in conflict at once. And I, I think that he can do something with that later. The focus on Sophocles here is pretty much the only thing that I have that I have to say about this chapter that I brought away that I really felt was important from this chapter. And as a English major in particular, um, the focus on it as drama that Sophocles was writing plays in which you have these seemingly impassable moral quandaries where you have the demands of the city on the one hand and the demands of the main character as a kin member on the other hand. Um, I think that's Antigone um, is, is yeah, I think Antigone. yeah, yeah. That's the classic example of that. And it's, you know, how do you deal with these conflicts where you have sort of the predecessor culture, in which case this is the Homeric society and the current culture of Athens, um, which is the democratic one and the city state as the ideal, um, which is significantly different from the Homeric framework. And the, that just being the basic of the tragic drama that we have to recognize the authority of all of these moral claims that are in conflict, but that because there is an objective moral order, we can't abandon any single one of them and sort of are, are subject for the sins of all of them. And thus the Sophoclean result of this is a deus ex machina where the god descends from a pulley on the top of the stage and just announces judgment and solves the problem for the characters who can't do it themselves. And I think there's something to that that in a very real and metaphysical sense that represents the state of moral order that maybe we've been in forever, you know, as a Christian Catholic. The human existence is heavily typified by tragedy. I mean, with the fall, you're cut off from the true dyke or the moral order, as he talks about in this chapter. And like in the plays, it probably does require a deus ex machina, or in this case, deus ex Jesus, um, to come in and solve the problem, or at least provide some resolution. Anyway, just the, the relation between tragedy and the sort of terrible conflict of moral systems that we find ourselves in and have found ourselves in for thousands of years reminded me why I love literature and the conflicts in them. So it's very refreshing. Yeah, that kind of goes back a I mean, it's a contrast to that with the interpretation of Plato. I think we talked about that a bit last week, and I don't remember if we went this far, but one strong interpretation of the Republic is that Plato was describing it to prove the point of how impossible it actually is, and how even if you put every bit of reason that you have into creating the perfect city, it, it, you can do it, but it's going to be miserable, and it's going to lose that human element. And so what Sophocles may be saying is that to be human is to have that existential gap between, uh, I don't know, between like what the virtues, like, between multiple different virtues. I mean, the, the, the full conflict is something like, you know, you have the, um, the sophists who are just like, eh, hey, morality is whatever you want, man. And then you have Plato who's like, well, actually there, there's only one moral order. And here I can design it and, you know, with the Republic, whether or not it's a satire, demonstrably it shows the failure that those type of projects inevitably come to, that, you know, the ideal harmony of city-state ethics and individual ethics can only be possibly met in a completely fiction idealized setting, which also is totally unworkable. Or what's going to be interesting to see in this next chapter, which I have not looked at at all, is... Aristotle vaguely falls on the side of Plato in that they're both on the team of there is a unified moral order 
that we can somehow get to eventually. Sophocles is on that team in a way, except for he's just a lot more uncertain about things. And thus, everything is kind of tragic because no matter how hard you try to get it right, you're going to still run into problems. I mean, Sophocles still thinks that there is a true objective moral order. It's just that we can't get there without a god coming down from the sky and telling us. I thought that the god coming down from the sky was, in essence, him admitting there. I, I, I'm not sure if he necessarily said, like, the gods have it figured out. I thought it was more a statement, this is unresolvable. Um, we need some sort of outside help. Uh, was it necessary? Well, I guess, which is potentially him nodding his head in approval towards the gods um, having a better glimpse of what's going on. So I, I suppose that is true. How are you? What is your state? Do you need help? Have you requested help? Have you received help? If so, anyway, sorry. The, the, the way you phrased that was entirely Walker Persian. Come back, come back, come back. That, uh, that, that line, it will haunt me till the end of uh, my days. Oh, I, I'm, I'm hoping, so I believe you, uh, we were somewhat on the topic of Plato, and I'm on the one hand, I'm, I'm somewhat disappointed in, uh, it, it seemed that Plato wasn't given a much treatment. He only got a couple of pages. But when McIntyre is turning to Aristotle, I'm hoping that, in essence, Plato and the Sophists are going to turn into analogies of, I don't know, perhaps the, the deontologists and the emotivists. And Aristotle is going to be kind of his solution to it. Um, and Sophocles is maybe going to be the analogy of, the overall condition as uh, the overall modern condition as Brevin pointed out. So I'm, I have hope that this chapter is important to his project in that he is setting up, this isn't the first time that this has happened. It had, we have, we as humans have been in the situation in which our ethical dialogues were only going in circles because, um, because we had different notions of the word virtue. Although to be fair, now we even have a notion of virtue. Um, at least back then we had notion of virtues. They just couldn't agree on what they were. I found the, example in the short story um, of Callicles, who was the, I think, the most logically consistent of the sophists in the example from the dialogues that McIntyre brings up, in that he was fully committed to the concept that, you know, just screw it, burn it all down, I'm a consistent relativist, what is good for whoever is the strongest, this is the true, like, pretty much as close to will to power as you can get, which is interesting because I, I confess I have not read all of Plato's works, all, all shame be upon me. But it's interesting because McIntyre just notes how Plato's dealing with this sort of, you know, interlocutor is different from the way that he deals with all the other ones, where he just shows their inconsistencies and is like, aha, you fool, you have a chink in your armor. But with Callicles, he can't because he's fully consistent and also fully monstrous, obviously. But that's sort of the, I don't know, it, it, it's a very modern predicament where you know some people have nothing to lose and are entirely consistent. Uh, what comes to mind is Peter Singer. I th- I want to say he's at Princeton. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The is he what would you call him? Utilitarian completely yeah, definitely utilitarian. Extreme utilitarian. Extreme utilitarian. Sam, do you want to take this briefly? Yeah, I mean Peter Singer is basically he's a what is his discipline? Is he a philosopher or a, a philosopher, I think. I think philosopher. He's a philosopher. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but he's done a lot of work on um, abortion, uh, abortion like philosophy and uh, ethics. And basically, he's built up an entirely consistent case for um, the right to an abortion um, to the point where he thinks it's ethically um, sound to kill a child up until the age of about two years old. Based on his conception of, you know, pleasure and pain. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, you, yeah totally. pleasure and pain and life and where all those values intersect it's justified to um, euthanize a child up until the age of two. And he supports um, physician-assisted or physician-required suicide once you reach the age where you've retired and you're, basically your health care costs are sucking more out of society than you're putting into it. Once you're a so, net drain, then... When you're about 75, go. I think, is, is kind of where you, you're capped. Even just the basic conception of it is just terrifyingly rationalist and inhuman i don't know wow yeah mm-hmm. two, two nuances i'd like to bring up with that though that's that's straight up utilitarianism i would say that that's not relativism not at least the of uh, the type that Callicles is bringing up Callicles is saying like no i will do what i want to do i will i you know since i will will's power and i will define my virtues according to what will bring me success and whatnot singer isn't going for that he his i i hesitate to say that his cause is more noble because i i think that the well, I would say his cause is more noble, his 
means are monstrous um, in that he is trying to form a more perfect society, whereas Calicles is just saying, no, screw it, I, I'm going to be a relativist because it's in my best interest. No, and that's the thing about Singer is that that space in the middle, your life is incredibly valuable and should be protected for the sake of it being a life, but for the sake of it being a life that contributes to society. Yeah, absolutely. Not... He's still committing the Kantian blunder of making people means to ends, or what Kant mm -hmm. considered a blunder, not, not to oh, absolutely. made that blunder. Um, so I'm not saying that they're making the same arguments. I'm saying that they're the same argument types in which you go fully to the conclusions. You accept no inconsistencies. And even when the conclusions are monstrous, you follow all the way through. And that's why it's so difficult for someone who relies on finding contradictions and mistakes like Plato to, like, you know, he just points those out and it's like, oh, great, now I win the argument. But with people like this that are so committed, it's they're the ones that are truly. Holes yeah. Because there are no holes, it's just the whole, the whole system. There are no holes, it's just, just the whole system. <laughs> <laughs> so, and so you're saying that the existence of thinkers like that, of thinkers like Callicles, of thinkers like Singer, means that reason alone can't arrive at absolute virtues. Something like that, or 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 even just that. I mean, no, I I don't I don't think it's that. I think it's reason will certainly help. It's just they're missing a, a vital piece. That's I mean that's McIntyre's entire project right now is yeah. saying no reason. Like he's not trying to ignore reason. I mean his. Like his reason is evident throughout the whole book. He's very logical. He's saying that all the reason in the world won't get you there if you don't know where you're trying to get, if you have completely yes. lost the concept of tales. If you don't have the god from the pulley pointing you in the direction, to uh, use your analogy with Sophocles. Well said. <laughs> It, it, in so, it is interesting. So I, yeah, Singer is terrible in some respects and he's wonderful in other respects. I mean, he does a lot of humanitarian work trying to, you know, sh uh, distribute aid to third world countries and whatnot. But man, like whatever admiration I can have for him there, yeah, he gets absolutely vicious with the abortion and euthanasia um, uh, sort of thing. I did. I wasn't aware of the two year old uh, bit. That one's that one's particular. Yeah, two year old and then. Uh, if you're disabled or have Down syndrome or autism or something like that, then it's, yep. I think, pure any time. If you have any sort of deficiency to your consciousness as we understand it to be a, as a complete, complete quote-unquote human being, then your faculty for experiencing utility, pain and pleasure, etc. is diminished. Therefore, you are not, your existence takes up resources. I'm curious. Does being a sociopath uh, to the be does else. being a sociopath to the point of wanting to kill two year old kids uh, put you in that category? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he says it does. Ah, uh, dang it! Yeah. Haha, -ha, we found an inconsistency. There is a hole in the system. Get it? But it, this is somewhat related to uh, one of the topics I wanted to bring up. Um, so last week we discussed how there are no undeceived Nietzscheans, that they cannot indeed find an ally in the Dionysian hero or, or in the, the Dionysian archetype that's found in the uh, Homeric heroes. Can they find an ally in uh, uh, Calicles? Probably. I mean, in, in the sense that they're, they're similarly committed to, well, actually, well, okay, okay. To sophists in general, no. To Calicles, probably. So as long as they remain consistent, their position is somewhat unassailable. I mean, they have a unassailable no, but like if you if you accept no criteria except for subjective what I like, then I mean it's it's not difficult to be in, inconsistent. You're at that point, you know, you're uh, what's the term? Totally isolated. Uh, you, you know, you know, your your moral system is solipsistic, which is fine and good, but like no one's going to be your friend. So pretty much Ayn Rand. Yeah. Fair enough, ladies and gentlemen, you heard it. Ayn Rand, if you want to be like Ayn Rand, join Calicles and uh, be, become a solipsist. And no one wants to be like Ayn Rand. How do you think Calicles would do in um, in Weberia? Um, would he just like marvel at the trains or try and take over them himself? Can <laughs> you imagine how much he could? Like, could he grow a mustache? That's the real important thing. Can he grow a real mustache? mustache? Maybe he would make like a like a Greek phalanx of uh, trains, just like <laughs> running over the landscape. <laughs> Oh, uh, God bless Waveria, except there is, of course, no God in Waveria. So what would it be? W uh, will bless Waveria? Individuals will will bless Waveria. That in train. The trains will bless Waveria. 
Um, does someone have a, another question or direction on this? Because honestly, the only point that I... Well, okay, I just did not like this chapter. Um, the only yeah. point that I thought was really important was the tragic drama, which I thought was the coolest part. But beyond that, I'm pretty much content to leave it be. Yeah, um, my only question is, can we move on to Aristotle, where McIntyre will actually make his argument? I, in, in defense, I, I suspect that this chapter is going to be important in setting up, because I think there is an analogy between the time of Athens and our current time, in that they were having yeah. the same difficulty in these ethical conversations that we are. Yep, and I yep. think he's going to pose that if Aristotle could solve them, Aristotle can solve us, or solve our problem and their problem, that is. With that, I'm pretty sure we've exhausted the energy that we wish to expend talking about chapter 11. I have exhausted 11, but we've exhausted ourselves. All right. Well, um, so let's let's transition here to uh, articles. Uh, uh, Stephen, I believe you had an interesting article for us this week. I did indeed. Uh, so I stumbled upon this, uh, this article. It's called uh, The Coming Care Crisis as Kids with Autism Grow Up. Uh, this one's particularly uh, meaningful to me. Um, I have uh, a younger brother who doesn't have autism, but has quite a few um, uh, just varying special needs and uh, disabilities and whatnot. Uh, it's by uh, Noah Remnick. Uh, it was written just th- uh, just last week, and it's in The Atlantic. In essence, uh, it is uh, about the fact that the state of care and support for those individuals with special needs, uh, it can be summed up in one rude word, and uh, the adults with special needs are certainly no exception to this uh, sad truth. So most, or th- this entire article it revolves around uh, a family with a special needs child, uh, the Solom- Solomonics. Um, most resources for people with disabilities are funneled into schools and pre-21 year old programs. Um, once an individual turns 21, the Individuals with Disabilities Act no longer supports them. They're no longer entitled to a free public education under f- federal law. And the nightmare of Kafka becomes all too real as parents and guardians attempt to navigate the labyrinthine uh, maze of government su- subsidies, social security support, etc. The rules on how to navigate these different things, the, the, the various um, agencies that are there to help, this shifts from state to state. Uh, federal laws around these sort of things are absolutely grotesque and outdated. Um, and therefore, the burden is placed on parents and guardians who are already stretched thin with the considerable task of taking care of a, a child who is now grown up but still very much needs them. The article cites uh, Paul Shattuck, a professor at Drexel University who studies autism, uh, when discussing the lack of support for special needs uh, adults. Um, and he comments, uh, it's as though we never really considered the fact that all these kids would eventually grow up. Oh, that's a quote. Uh, and indeed, it would appear that way. Uh, the statistics cited are absolutely tragic. Quote, about half of adults with autism continue to grapple with aggressive, self-injurious behaviors as they get older, and about half are also unemployed, the lowest employment rate among disability groups. Especially for those with greater challenges, it is more difficult to attain the basics necessary to live a comfortable life, housing, job training, and social opportunities, end quote. Uh, and this demographic gets less than 2% of autism funding, I should also note. Uh, the article doesn't really go much more into the various statistics and whatnot. It um, explores the story of the Solomonics, uh, which is discussing the difficulties that go into raising a special needs child, which I won't necessarily get into a ton here. But I mean, having witnessed it and whatnot, it's certainly, it, it is certainly difficult. Um, quite a few uh, parents of special needs children end up being divorced from the stress. And it's just on the whole, it, it can yield it, as, as many difficult situations uh, do. It can yield the most, the most beautiful characters in the world that have preserved and become absolutely virtuous on or it can it can yield breaking and it can yield some very uh, broken and desperate people it also i think does a good job at highlighting the difficulties navigating the bureaucracy of state aid and such uh, citing massive piles of government paperwork frustrating rules ostensibly designed to protect special needs children from being taken advantage of but proving more hindrance than a protection things like that uh frustrating thing uh, this means that even with the pathetically small amount of money offered, there's plenty left on the table because no one can navigate the system, according to uh, Vanderbilt's uh, professor of pediatrics and special needs, Julie Lowndes Taylor. Taylor, sorry, can't speak. Uh, it's nearly impossible for, for professionals to navigate, much less middle and lower class families who don't necessarily have the time or resources to devote to navigating this whole bureaucratic nightmare. The closing paragraph is quite damning in itself. Uh, quote, just this year, uh, the son of uh, Marie, one of the Solomonics, uh, the, the mother, uh, Marie's friend, was declared ineligible for government funding because of a $51 discrepancy in his bank account, end quote. Um, 
that sort of thing is very real. Uh, and this, I'll, I'll wait, I'll get more into that during my rant. Uh, but the sum of the matter is uh, the most vulnerable of our society get hurt from this. And this is, this is somewhat personal uh, for me. My brother has developmental uh, disabilities and my parents are experiencing a taste of this nightmare, trying to get him set up with social security and such. He's just turned 19 and uh, he's facing down the barrels of uh, trying to navigate all that. But uh, like I said, I'll get into that in my rant, but very worthwhile article, difficult to read article, but worth it. Yeah. I mean, Stephen, um, you know, this article also hits home for me too. I mean, kind of, or I, I, I get your position closely. Uh, my brother just turned 19 as well and also has um, autism. So I definitely see the issues of trying to navigate, you know, what government assistance programs are best, what independent, what does independence look like, um, mm-hmm. right. and kind of trying to set up those plans and rapidly um, before before that 21 mark. And also after you, after you turn 18, even individuals with autism actually have a lot of, um, they have a lot of autonomy legally as to what they want to do. And, and so... It's been it's been a challenge of trying to figure out. Okay, so what do, what what control should my parents legally get? What control should my brother get? How do you set how do you set that up? You know, do you, do you need to bring in an attorney even? Which is just it's it's crazy. Yeah, absolutely. That, yeah, the whole situation becomes, I imagine, quite a lot more complicated mm-hmm. with that kind of third factor. I, Thankfully, for my for my own part, Justin has been very um, kind of compliant with that, just kind of going with the flow. So. Thankfully, at least so far, my parents haven't really had to wrestle with that. Um, I can't imagine that being uh, particularly mm-hmm. easy. <laughs> Good night. Yeah. Uh, so my article is only tangentially related in that it addresses sort of issues and topics related to less advantaged members of our society. It's uh, dollars on the margin in the New York Times on their Future of Work series. Uh, quite interesting and I do recommend it. I'm generally on the classical econ side of things. So when things like the fight for 15, which is the fight for a $15 minimum wage gets passed in a city, and then there are fewer hirings and arbitrary firings and small businesses close because they can't afford it like clockwork. I'm not surprised. Uh, There's always a cost benefit analysis and the cost is often visible. Like you definitely hurt people with policies like this. People just aren't able to cope. And this article didn't quite cause a crisis of my economic thinking, um, but it did remind me, I think, to some good effect, that there are people who these policies do help, that there is a positive side, even with a limited effect. Henry Hazlitt wrote a book called Economics in One Lesson, which is very useful. And one of the things he talks about is that the problem with using the government to transfer money is that you always know and can see who the people that are helped are. Like, they're very obvious and, you know, front and center, they get news articles written about about them, but the costs of it are dispersed among numerous people, and that's often invisible and damaging in the long run. However, this article for me was a reminder that people can be helped and that there are people who can be helped, because most of the time my mindset is, fo- is, is trying to find out what the dispersed invisible costs are. And this talks about sort of the economic benefits of just a few dollars increase or, or even a few cents increase to wages. Um, and, and, and this highlights it very well. And that in some cases, limited cases, I would say, the price of labor might be artificially low for one reason or another, and raising it can make a net positive impact. So now a quote just from the opening of the article, a quote. In 2014, Julio Pays was working 80 hours a week at two full-time jobs. A permanent resident from Guatemala who came to the United States on a work visa, Pays worked in Emeryville, California, a city of roughly 12,000 residents and almost 22,000 jobs, sandwiched between Oakland and Berkeley. He began his day with a graveyard shift at a 24-hour McDonald's where he served burgers and fries from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Afterward, he had two hours to rest and to shower. Then he'd clock in at Aerotech, going anywhere that the temp service sent him between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. To stay awake, he loaded up on coffee and soda. Each job paid minimum wage. I felt like a zombie, Pace told me. No energy, always sad. Yet just to afford basic necessities. He had to work up to 16 hours a day, seven days a week. Back then, he, his mother, and two siblings all shared a single unfurnished room. They were a tight-knit family, but Pay's work schedule kept him away. Once, his younger brother, Alexander, who was eight at the time, told him he was saving money. I want to buy one hour of your time, Pays remembers his brother telling him. How much for one hour to play with me? Pays looked at his brother and wept. Not long after that, Pays fainted from exhaustion in the aisle of a grocery store. He was 24 years old, end quote. And the story goes on, and in, in, inevitably the uh, sort of Emeryville, the small town, did a minimum wage hike, 
wages went up, at least for those who were hired and it helped. And so he was able to work fewer hours and, and can support his family better. Uh, the story goes on um, talking about how the small town passed a law to raise the minimum wage, which helped out. And then um, Pays could work fewer hours total and support his family better, spend time with his siblings, et cetera. And the rest of the article is sort of just a summary of some studies that have been done on how small raises in wage on the margins function to help a whole bunch of social issues. Uh, for example, a 2011 national study showed that low wage workers reported fewer unmet medical needs in states with higher minimum wage rates. In other words, they were better able to pay for the care that they need, so they relied less on Medicare or emergency care services. There's another one where just a few dollars increased to the minimum wage means a decreased rate of smoking among low-income workers, which is just sort of goes to show that higher wages can ease the grind of poverty and free up people's capacities to quit. There's other examples, like a 2017 study which showed that raising the minimum wage by $1 would reduce child neglect reports by almost 10% because that would just allow... Um, parents in low-wage labor markets to keep their lights on, keep their refrigerator stocked, both of which are conditions for getting you know, a court neglect charge. And so in short, there's a, a quote towards the end of the article that was pretty impactful. Uh, quote, a $15 minimum wage is an antidepressant. It is a sleep aid, a diet, a stress reliever. It is a contraceptive preventing teen pregnancy. It prevents premature death. It shields children from neglect, end quote. And so I, I, I think this article did do some help because it reminded me that economics is always a matter of cost-benefit analysis, but that I tend to focus on cost, in, in particular on issues like this. And even though I will note that you know, talking about these studies all focused on workers and did not focus on the people who couldn't get jobs at all because of you know, a tightened labor market because of a higher minimum wage, for example. But all that aside, this article was a good read, a helpful read, and you know, a bit of a humanization to economic talk that I needed. So. I'm curious. It, it seems that the kind of cost-benefit analysis and whatnot that inherently comes with economics, uh, and just some of the the ways you should go about making these sort of economic decisions, it does strike me as very kind of utilitarian, borderline people as means to end sort of thing. How how do you how do you fit that in um, with a more virtue uh, ethics approach? Uh, I have no idea how it fits into a mer to a virtue ethics approach, but the general idea would be that interventions into markets allow power grabs by untoward actors. For example, if you raise the minimum wage across you know, a large region, larger companies can probably cope better than smaller companies, which allows larger companies to get rid of all their competitors. Um, or, okay. or for example, if you raise the minimum wage, that's true, all of these people will have, all, all of the people currently hired will have better um, job opportunities in terms of, you know, they're being better paid. However, that also means that the bar to get into the market is higher. So, for example, there was an, another article in the New York Times talking about a city where the minimum wage was was uh, raised to $15 an, an hour. And it was complaints from workers that they were being fired for arbitrary reasons. And I think you sent that a while ago, right? <laughs> yeah. But the fact is, so if you have a labor market where everyone at a entry-level fast food job is being paid $15 a, an hour, employers have an incentive to get as much value as they can out of that. So if you are a deficient worker in even a very small way where previously it's fine, you know, you're paying them $12 an hour, 15 or, you know, $7 an hour, that's fine. You can overlook that. It's not a net cost to you. But when you're paying sort of a premium for workers, at least at that skill level, then you're incentivized to basically pick as good as you can possibly be. And because there is a limited amount of money that you can spend on your payroll, you're able to fire people and hire much faster and easier um, because everyone wants the job and there's a limited number of job spots. So that's just one of the, the costs. And I'd like that. to add that the people who end up getting fired are usually in like the worst situations out of those employees. I know I've worked a fast food job before and it wasn't a job I was working out of necessity. It was just a summer job at something to do over the summer and earn a little bit of cash but because i had like i was i was living you know in a, in a middle class family i may have had less issues with getting to work and showing up to my shift and stuff than another person who actually needed a job far more than i did would have had and so in that situation they would have lost the job but they need it more than i do yeah exactly so you know and and say the minimum wage is seven dollars an hour sam can work that during that's no problem um, and they can also hire a second person also at $7 an hour who, you know, might have to work a lot, but at least they have a job. On the other hand, if it's $15 an hour, they can only hire one person every time they're going to prefer Sam. So, 
anyway, that's just the... I mean, I would hire Sam for $15 an hour. But speaking of Sam, um, I'm not paying you $15 for this, uh, but I believe you've had an article too. I do have an article, and uh, this one's from the opposite end of the political spectrum. This is the Social Media Censorship Dumpster Fire by David French, who's the senior editor at National Review. I usually don't read National Review, but I saw... I heard David French on a podcast and um, he sounded amazing. So I, I looked at some of his work. I mean, I, I knew who he was, but I hadn't read very many of his articles. And this one in particular was very interesting. So he basically looks at the social justice um, initiative in social media censorship. And he starts off by talking about what he calls the first wave of social ju- justice censorship. He was a lawyer um, working with clients in freedom of speech cases. And so he talked about some of the more humorous uh, freedom of speech uh, policies that he had to combat. I'll read a few of these pretty quickly because they're very funny. Uh, Penn State University declared that, quote, acts of intolerance will not be tolerated. Uh, The Georgia Institute (laughs) of Technology prohibited, quote, denigrating written verbal communications, including the use of telephones, emails, and computers directed toward an individual because of their characteristics or beliefs. So saying anything negative towards that person. Temple University banned, quote, generalized sexist remarks, only generalized ones. Uh, You can be as specific as you want with your (laughs) remark, but if you're general, it's generalized. It's just game over. (laughs) And then uh, Shippenburg University uh, in Pennsylvania, quote, Shippenburg University's commitment to racial tolerance, cultural diversity, and social justice will require every member of the community to ensure these principles and ideas are mirrored in their attitudes and behaviors. Basically, this diversity is going to require everybody to think the exact same way. Um, So he was a lawyer, and he talked about how basically in every single one of these cases, his clients won. Because when you bring any of these issues to court, there's actually very little legal or constitutional basis for those rules. They don't make any legal, logical sense. And so he concluded, and again, this is a conservative talking, so he may be a little um, a little overstated in this, but he basically said previous social justice censorship was entirely unproductive. And now we're seeing it happen again with social media, particularly Facebook's struggle. He actually explores two different articles um, with their perspectives. First is one in Vanity Fair, which was... Uh, That's uh, my trusted news source. It's, it's a solid one, uh, and one that I, I guess David French frequents. I don't know. But they they did uh, an expose on Facebook censorship from the top down, and then The Verge did one from the bottom up. So first from the top down, um, he kind of phrases this in context of one major issue Facebook had during the Me Too movement uh, with the phrase, men are scum. Do you purge that phrase or do you not purge it? I mean, what do you guys think? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Please, please don't, don't kill me in the crowd. <laughs> Where's the guillotine uh, line? I'd, I'd like to get in first place. I think we established that's the best spot to be. We did establish that. I guess I'll be right behind yes. you. Um, I just want to, to note yes. that I'm being gracious in that. Well, there were sometimes they have, they have two guillotines going at once. So I'll take it. Yeah. But the issue that Facebook ran into is that if you purge that, that's political censorship, which they're traditionally very opposed to. But if you leave it up, you're allowing looser gender rules. And so someone could say something like, women are scum, which... Oh, no, 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 can't, yeah. no, 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 bad. That is a hard exactly. Mouth. exactly. And so their solution was, well, why don't we just treat the genders differently? It's not singling one out. It's just, you know, different rules for different genders. But then you look at what all the other genders are. And if you're protecting 55 out of the 56 genders, well, now you're targeting a particular gender. Mm-hmm. And so this is a whole conundrum. Facebook has kind of written up some vague guidelines for that, but they're very convoluted. And what French points out is how how arbitrary you get when you go down the censorship path um, on the top. From from the actual like on the on on the ground level of actually executing these policies, they aren't self executing. You actually need real monitors, people who are moderators, coming in and looking through flagged posts. And often these moderators are actually traumatized by what they're seeing, and they're convinced by the information that they have to censor. In the article, there were some interviews with some of these moderators who, because of their job, had become flat earthers and 9-11 truthers because they had to go through so much of that content. That was my favorite part of that article. (laughs) (laughs) And so his question is, do you really want our standard of morality and decency to be determined by flat earthers and 9-11 truthers in, you know, office buildings around the world? 
I don't think there's anything more postmodern than that. So <laughs> I'm all in favor. Eat, man. Yeah. So it's just very messy. Uh, you get a bunch of weird priorities. Like basically their general rule of thumb is that gender is first and then race and then this disability. So you can't say men should be sterilized, but you should say to, uh, uh, to look back at your article, Stephen, that, you know, uh, people with autism should be sterilized. That's allowed. Wow. That's great. That's glad cool. to hear this. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's messy. And, um, we're not living in a culture of death. Yeah, it's a super positive culture of life. Uh, I'm sorry. My, my articles are always so depressing, I'm realizing. You seriously like, just make us sad. Care, mine was too. Well, why worry. do you all... It's, it's your fault for always making me go last. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, so, so Sam, um, I, I think there's a ton of interesting stuff on um, Facebook content moderators mm-hmm. and just their attempts to build up a... Unified rulebook. I've I, I heard like a, a podcast on this and that, like was it the Radio Lab? Radio Lab. Yeah, yeah. Or, yeah, uh, I was, yeah. I was gonna Radio talk about Lab. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do no evil, but just like trying to make a worldwide, like universal in the full sense, content rules, and it's almost like a case of for the first time doing a universal categorical imperative search. Like, what is what are the proper contents for everyone at all times and all places? And then they're just always constantly failing as they're having to adjust to new situations. And much like we learned in the plays of Sophocles, the inevitable outcome is a deus ex machina of upper management where, for example, in the case of you know uh, drug violence and crime and explicit content in, in those cases in Mexico, they're like, no, we're not going to show that. But then when it comes to cool American news, like the Boston bombing, and it's like, oh, no, actually, we do have to show that even though by our standard that we used on the Mexico case, we absolutely should not. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's it, it, it's a good time. The entire thing is basically designed. They've got like a 51-page uh, and counting document that Facebook's designed. And every time a really tough situation comes up where the the manager is, where, where it's a, if a moderator can't deal with it, they pass it on to their manager. If their manager can't do, deal with it, they bring it to their supervisor. If their supervisor can't deal with it, it continues to be passed up. And then if Zuck can't, can't determine something, it gets a little, or whatever someone determines, it gets a little line item on the document of what you should do. I don't I don't really um, know if I trust the future of all discourse to um, a lizard man. Um, I know that might be sort of discriminatory against our Illuminati overlords, you know, who have or come from, from the planet Xenon in order to uh, control us with their lizard brains. But like, I don't know, like it just seems a little bit weird. Like I think humans should be ruled by humans. Um, yeah. Did you just combine Scientology and lizard people theory? No. Oh. I mean, it's the same thing. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> yeah, so it's bad. Um, also, you add in the fact that these moderators actually just ignore the document, like most yep. of the time. And it's messy. His conclusion is a little bit better. as He basically says that we should use a decency standard like public, public broadcasting media does, and that censorship is impossible. But if you just have like, you know, just strict, clear, upfront standards, you're good to go. Simple rules for a complex society. Yep. I am curious, like around the free speech, I, I've heard this kind of counterexample brought up a couple of times that you can't yell fire in a crowded movie theater or what have you. Um, would that apply? Would there be any sort of analogy to social media? Um, one of the, the big uh, things that have been going around uh, these days is kind of the the anti-vax versus the vax and whatnot, um, and without getting too much into the politics of that, uh, which um, I'm actually so mad at my Facebook feed right now. At, is it all anti-anti-vax? Yes. No. Or, wait, but that's been all mine. It's just all anti-anti-vax. It's like, guys, we all agree with each other. Can we just stop? No, no. There's I I have enough sort of weird fringe. Um, what would I call them? Um, essential oil, fish oil, evangelicals that I I, I have some <laughs> anti-vax still on my. Feed. Oh yeah, what I was saying is, uh, sorry, Stephen, I misunderstood you. Is yeah, my Facebook feed is mostly anti-vax. Really? See, I I've got main like the only thing I ever see is anti-anti-vax, which I guess I would rather see that than anti-vax. To be fair, you know what, uh, Stephen, it's, it's it sounds like you're a mind. cultural elite and you're living in a bubble. Um, and I think you need to get out to the Midwest where real Americans live, um, because obviously mm. you don't understand. Uh, obviously Midwest. me in my highfalutin Seattle place, you know, just be- I, I think I'm better than you, probably because I'm better than you. <laughs> I mean, if you can't get out to the Midwest. You're, you're voting for Howard school. Schultz, aren't you? <laughs> um, all right. So <laughs> no, if, you, if you can't get out to the Midwest, Stephen, your local homeschool co-op will work fine. <laughs> <laughs> <Touché>. <laughs> Please cut <Touché>. that out. <laughs> <laughs> 
just because of that, I'm going to leave it in. But now let's move on to our rants, because it's obviously that we're angry about things. Oh, I forgot about rants. Crap. Okay. Okay. Uh, Steven, you go first while, while Sam thinks of his. I will go first. And as I indicated when going over my article, my rant is around the kafka nightmare that is government funding around people with disabilities. So uh, there is an old, I think... I, so I was talking with my mom about this. They're trying to figure out how Justin can get some, you know, some savings uh, set up uh, so that he can, you know, live a relatively normal life. Like he's, he's special needs to the point that he probably will need assistance for the rest of his life. And that's fine. But he should have some amount of independence and be able to, you know, have some money put away in the bank account, whatnot. But there is, I believe, an old 1930s law that says that he cannot have more than $2,000 in his bank account and still be on social security. Wow. Um, 2000, I did the math, uh, is roughly 30,000 in uh, today's uh, standards. It was, this law, perfectly reasonable back then, and still, to, like, in a, an analog of it would be perfectly reasonable now to keep people from, you know, super abusing the system and just using it to collect as much as they want, you know? It should be an edge case that people get social security when they're, you know, in their 20s or what have you. But in essence, they are forcing him to live in poverty for the rest of his life because he can't have more than two thousand dollars. The um, uh, the the one uh, friend uh, friend of Marie whose uh, kid was declared ineligible for government funding because of a fifty one dollar discrepancy. That crap is real. Like my my parents had deal had to deal with something very similar to that. And it's the most stupid and idiotic thing in the world that they haven't updated that dumb dumb law. And it's just with with, with all of that, uh, or, or the entire process of getting funding for the most vulnerable people in our society, or at least arguably the most vulnerable people in our society, it should not be this difficult. And it should not be this Kafka esque, especially since. A lot of the people, uh, the, the caretakers of people with special needs, it's not an easy job, especially when you get to more severe uh, special needs. And it should be like the, we should be helping them instead of making it as insanely asinine as possible. And so my rant is for the moronic government that won't freaking take care of this crap. So for all the many government employees that are listening to this, get your crap together, everyone. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, well, for my rant this week uh human beings as organisms who live in an environment the ideal humidity is around 40 to 50 percent slightly lower than that in winter just because you'll get condensation on your windows if you have it at 50 percent um so i already have pretty bad skin so keeping a good humidity stops me from cracking turning red and generally falling to pieces and in our house we recently bought a humidifier that we try and keep running which keeps it pretty reasonable and that's all right uh but Recently, I learned the state of my work environment, where I spend 40 plus hours a week. So it fluctuates, but the average is right between 1 and 3% humidity, which is basically a desert. All I can say is that the dearth of humidity properly follows from the lack of content in our ethical discourse. That is to say, if our words are empty of meaningful content, it is only natural that our air is empty of moisture content. And I would make a final note that my office is directly across the hallway from the entire philosophy department. Well said. All right, well, my rant is not particularly a rant. Um, I guess it is. So as I mentioned earlier, I um, I finally am no longer a minor this week. I turned 21. And um, me and some friends went out for a, for a nice, jolly good 21 run. Um, and I discovered that after 21 years of anticipating this moment, Alcohol is insanely expensive. Had no idea. Like, somehow, I'd never put the pieces together, but it just kind of reflected the state. I, I mean, would it be a stretch to say that it's um, it's similar to what Nietzsche is talking about when you reach the pinnacle of modernity and uh, it's left bare and dry and uh, similar to Brevin's skin, actually. <laughs> <laughs> So that's my rant. Is uh, I guess uh, everyone keeps telling me life is all down here, tell from here. And after seeing the prices on those menus in the uh, yuppie bars of Ballard, I I agree. Life is all downhill, and therefore they can aff- they, they know that they can make you buy their alcohol for ridiculous expensive. It's a it's a vicious cycle. Because we're that desperate. Exactly. It's it's rough, man. Let me tell you. Yeah. Anyway, so maybe that's just me whining, and I'm not trying to sound like some uh, entitled millennial by saying that. All to say is, uh, I don't know what the point of this is. When you're empty on meaning, fill up with fruity cocktails. Meaning, drink bourbon. Yes! Actually, though. But see, okay, yeah, whatever. Um, All right, so uh, I have one final thing to do, uh, which is a shout-out to our newest listener, which is Kasana, 
who is Kasana? My sister. The full disclosure is that she skips over the McIntyre esoteric philosophical wrangling to the good stuff, the articles, and uh, actually even brought up some stuff that she heard with her friends, uh, namely your coding article, Stephen. Um, and really? the Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the uh, is ought distinction, the watch example, um, although we used a different version of it in whatever one she listened to. Um, but anyway, so we uh, welcome Kasana to the font of knowledge that is the problem with reading. Um, she also recommended that we have more guests and voices on the show, um, something I'm in favor of also. She was, she was sick of hearing from these three um, clueless white dudes. Yep. Yeah, that's, no, I, I get yeah. it. <laughs> ah, damn it, Sam. I want to tell you something that someone told me about your voice, but he, he, yeah, I just need to wait. Let me just say that that your your uh, sultry, sexy voice has a secret admirer. Um, that really, yeah, mm-hmm. they you, they you're... yeah they they think that you have the the best voice, and that your voice. Uh, the quote was something like, "Your voice sounds like you're always telling someone a secret, like you and the other person, are, and, and the listener are the only two people in the room." <laughs> 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 I I have no idea to say what to say to that. Um, I mean, thank hey, you. why don't you tell Apparently them? You can say anything thank you now, to it? my my dear listener. I guess I I don't even know. That's that's the weirdest thing anybody's ever told me. I'm <laughs> no like yeah. Stephen. What do you think about it? Like you know, my voice is you know choppy and whatever. Your voice is whatever. But Sam, like that's NPR quality right there. It's like hello, mm-hmm. this is Sam Scott with another episode of. On being today, we're talking with blah blah blah. blah. Yeah, except yeah. I have a lisp. <laughs> hey, that's that's part of your I wouldn't complain. Of- it works. Yeah, we're just writing your coattails right now. We're just mm-hmm. hoping that you okay. will take us to greatness. So please do. Well, good luck in the next two weeks when I am gone. Oh, that yeah. hurts. Our ratings will plummet. Um, yeah, they really will. Our our ratings of twelve listeners will go down to zero. Um, we will like, rebuild. Oh, don't don't leave us, everyone. We will rebuild. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, remember us when you come into your kingdom. Well, I'm pretty sure that signals the end of meaningful content that we can create. Oh, I think the end came long ago. <laughs> All right. Uh, so for everyone here at the Problem with Reading podcast, uh, I'm Brevin. I'm Steven. And I'm Sam. And we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. Enlightenment. I'm looking at this, and yeah, no, it's a, it's a short bibliography. It's like three pages long for a 280-page book. What's really interesting is um, to contrast, just like, you know, short bibliography, sure, but there's a philosophy of writing from Nicholas Nassim Taleb, where he basically says, I don't use any footnotes or quotes because you should not write about anything that you have to go look up in a library. Like, basically, you should just know it. And so his book's have no citations and it's just all stuff that he apparently knows which is interesting i've I've heard of that philosophy that's called plagiarism